Okay, we've got an incredible panel tonight, thanks to Invest HK. Um, we're actually going to talk about Asian fintech. And I'd first of all like to introduce myself. I'm basically Pemo Theodore. Uh, we do a lot of live streaming and video in the startup ecosystem. And um, I also organize the Bay Area fintech meetups and the Silicon Valley fintech meetups. We've got over 1K membership and even more. Um, we have bi-monthly meetups or the really talks or panels and you're all welcome to come. Uh, if you're interested to sign up, just come and grab me and I'll give you my card later. Um, but now I'd like to really focus on the people that are most important on this panel, um, the panelists, and the first person I'd like to introduce them, and they're going to tell you a bit about themselves, Winston. Oh, sorry. Uh, Lawrence. Lawrence Tang, Lawrence Tang. excuse me. And I'll leave it to you. OK. So um, let's make um, something funny. So this is the page that I want to cover, but usually it is a two-hour meeting. <laughs> so it's a bit challenging to do it in the panel. But let's do it this way and then keep it short, and then I will get alert from the moderator about the time. So uh, I'm with the Invest Hong Kong, which is the Hong Kong government office. Uh, I'm based in San Francisco with my team, Michael, Terry, Robin. So we are based here to talk to companies about business opportunities in Hong Kong. So now, back to this panel, it's FinTech Asia. So let me do it uh, in this way. Most government people will talk about policies and then incentives. That's too boring. Let's focus on you. So you look at market, you want business opportunities. Let's start with Asia as a whole, and then we zoom in China, Hong Kong, and then take it there. So Asia as a whole for FinTech. I was reading a McKinsey report. It says that half of the small and medium-sized companies in, in, in Asia, actually, they are either unbanked or underserved. So there is a credit gap of about $2 trillion that need to be funded. So the other figure is also very interesting. One third of people in Asia, they are unbanked or underserved. But on the other hand, the report shows that 8% of those people, actually, they don't have cell phone. So that means there is a gap that lots and lots of people, they need funding, they don't have a bank account or something, but they do have cell phones, whereby financial services can be de delivered. So there is a big, big demand in all the areas of lending, funding, remittance. For example, the report shows $500 billion dollars of, of revenue, of money, is, is remitted back in Asia and developing countries. So lots of, lots of opportunities. Bank usually charge 5 to 8%. Mobile payment, about 4%. But sometimes the latest technology is that prepaid card can be below 2%. So very interesting, a lot of business. Payment is another area. So let, let's turn to China. Payment is very big in China. For example... Could we introduce the other speakers first? Is that okay? And then okay. we'll go on with the conversation. Yeah. All right, Sorry, so that's why the first alert. <laughs> okay. I'm just being bossy here, but um, okay. I, I just wanted to include the other other speakers. And um, we've got Karen Husse here. Do you want to introduce yeah, yourself? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. So I'm Karen, and I'm with Block Cipher. And Block Cipher is like Amazon Web Services for blockchains. So how many of you have heard of blockchains here? OK, most of you, great. So. Um, we provide blockchain web services, which is the middleware between applications and all the blockchain protocols. So our differentiation is that we're blockchain agnostic, and that means we support all the major blockchains, permissioned, and public. Uh, Winston with the Pingpong Global Solutions. Um, we're China-based uh, payment company helping China and Hong Kong based e-commerce sellers to receive payouts from overseas. So we launched our business at the beginning of 2016 in the US first, and right now in Japan, and we're about to launch in Europe. Um, Thanks, Winston. <laughs> OK, so um, I've been reading this year that uh, FinTech in Asia is, is growing rapidly. In fact, um, I know that Citi did an incredible um, 
synopsis of how much um, fintech in Asia has grown in 2016. It topped all the investment uh, uh, compared to the US. So do you want to talk a little bit about um, your experience of that? Like, why is that happening? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, I guess um, in China, particularly, um, the commerce development has been um, booming in recent years or recent decades. Um, so from what we see is that from China export um, from China to the U.S. alone in the year of 2016, it's about 400, a little bit over 400 billion dollars. And a smaller portion of it is e-commerce. It's kind of a B2C um, uh, uh, space. The majority of it is kind of a B2B. It's import, export. So a lot of things actually, especially for what we do, payments, we see uh, cross-border out of China and also domestically um, it, within China as well. So we've seen a lot of investment from China um, as well in uh, certain markets like blockchain, which is what we focused on. And it's really the government that's doing a lot of that investment and spearheading that investment. Um, we're also Chinese seeing government. the Chinese government. So I can say Guiyang, for example, um, came here in January and spent a lot of time with Silicon Valley. Um, was very serious about talking how about how to invest in certain companies. Um, and then you also have Japan um, that also has done a number of investments um, and you know, there are a number of companies there that are, are seriously working with not only investment but also business development. So there's, there's that hand in hand um, you know, part that's going on with the different uh, roles in the organization. So, so that's been uh, very interesting to see and it's a, and it's a, a trend you know, that has been going on for years. So do you, you, do you feel that it's because the government in China is um, placing attention and, and investment in this area that it's, it's why it's leading the US? Uh, yes, I mean, that's, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, follow on with Winston's uh, e-commerce. Because e-commerce always come along with the payment part of it. So actually, there are some figures by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, uh, February report saying that Worldwide, 50% of the e-commerce transaction actually happened in China. The rest of the world add up is the other 50%. So in terms of payment element, so everybody heard about Alipay, so the end financial. Actually, interesting enough, so there is a so-called unicorn list by uh, CB Insight. 206 companies on the unicorn list, or the club, they call it. Fintech, there are actually 26 companies in the fintech space, and then the U.S. has 14. Out of 26, U.S. has 14. It's pretty impressive. But for Bay Area, interesting enough, Bay Area alone, out of the 14, there are eight companies from Bay Area that make the unicorn list. So San Francisco companies are doing quite well in fintech. But look at China. So Alipay. It's not on the unicorn list because it's under Alibaba. It's listed, so they are out. But on the other hand, there are six China companies on the fintech uh, unicorn list. More interesting enough, the 14 US unicorns in fintech, total value is 34 billion, but the six China unicorns in the fintech, they are 32 billion. So you see the value and you see the market. Is right there. Um, so, why do you think Asia is more attractive for fintech than here? Any ideas? Um. Oh, yeah, so I wouldn't say Asia is more attractive. Okay. I would say it's equally attractive. Um, I certainly agree um, with what Lawrence is saying in terms of the market size and the, the number that are unbanked, especially you know in, in the areas that we're dealing with around payments. Uh, but I do think, in general, um, the the you know the Asian market, whether it's the government or corporations that have a longer term view and they're willing to invest, um, there has been a history of carefully watching the West and learning and um, trying to leapfrog where it makes sense. Uh, so that kind of history and um, best practice, uh, I think, is leading to that investment that we see. Yeah, I guess um, um, because of the population size, the growing of the, the middle class, the demand, and everything, I guess the market size is there. 
And also, another historically, um, China has been kind of less developed uh, comparing with the West. I guess that created opportunity when technology developed, all the infrastructure being built. Um, so over there, all the kind of nece um, the necessary elements are coming together, um, make it um, possible for all the fintech companies to make things um, a reality. Yeah, I really like the keyword of the leaf rock because I am I'm actually a UK chartered telecom engineer. One good example of China is that actually they leaf rock the fixed network era. There's very much, there's no fixed network there whatsoever, or very minimal. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly, in a, in a decade, it's all mobile. It's all mobile. So we see that probably in some areas of fintech, China can do something similar, just like e-commerce, just like payment. So something similar can happen. Um, so I'm actually a foreigner, as you probably noticed. <laughs> and I have had uh, questions about why uh, the US has been so slow with fintech. And uh, some of the speakers at my talks have said that it's complacency, that um, people here are used to, in the banks, are used to having their pay and the way things are. Um, and so it's not been as urgent as possibly it has been in China. Would you guys have any comments on that? Oh, yeah, I, mean, I definitely can say that. Having worked in the blockchain space for a while now, um, the banks are eager, um, and you know I've been in enterprise software for 20 years. The banks have always been, I'd say, on the forefront of technology, not necessarily always being the first, but um, definitely interested in seeing what's going on. So, um, but having said that, right there, there are there is a lot of complacency because there's just a lot of money there, and there has always been a lot of money, and um, you can say that some of the um, the recent dynamics in blockchain and sort of the, some people have said, well, the banks have been slow to adopt blockchain. Um, some people will say that, and, and some will say that's because of the, the complacency we talked about, but also because those that are in power really have no incentive to make a big change, right? I mean, they're going to live out their lives very well, their careers very well, just as things are. Um, they don't need to worry about anything else. Where in other parts of the world, where you have so many that are unbanked, where it costs 10% per transaction, it takes weeks to get money, they're gonna make the change, right? I mean, it's because that's where the need is. Um, so I absolutely agree, you know, there is a lot of that that's uh, slowing things down. Anyone else comment? Yeah, I guess in China, the same thing. So um, most of the, uh, all the major banks are state-owned. So all the banks have no incentive to be creative, to be innovative. Um, um, they don't have to understand customers' needs, what they were looking for, because they don't really have a choice but to, to, to work with them, um, to use the banks. Um, so I guess, you know, with the, with the new things, with the transaction volume increases, everything else, um, a lot of the people, they cannot, just traditional banks they can, simply cannot meet their, uh, the demands. Yeah, because there, there is another interesting point that in, in the US, so there are lots of well-established financial institutions providing all sorts of financial services. But in China, Asia, so most of them are non-existent. It is, might be available to medium and bigger size companies, but for the small and medium size, not. So just like, take one example, you like examples, I guess. So in China, for example, there is no credit history, no credit score, nothing. But then, if it is a youngster, they want to buy something like a 60-inch uh, flat screen 4K TV, uh, let's say $1,000. So they, they don't have out of pocket. Traditionally, the banks, no credit history, nothing, sorry. So there's no provider of service to that. But one Hong Kong company cracked the code, the Vinci code of something that they based on the social media activity and then big data analytics come up with the probability of payment and then on their web, on the app, 15 second application and approval comes back in 15 seconds. So that's why with that access to China market, they actually became the world second largest Series B FinTech funding of the world last year. 160 million funding Series B last year. And guess who in the Series A of the 20 million, Sequoia was good enough, smart enough to be in the Series A. So in some ways, one key word always people hear is that disruptive technology. 
But sometimes I, I think that, no, you don't need to, to have any disruptive technology because it's nothing that you need to disrupt. It's no, in that particular niche market, there's nothing there. So it's, if you are creative enough, your technology good enough, and adaptive enough to find the right way for market entry, China, Asia is right there. <clears throat> so there's something that I've noticed with the um, FinTech meetups that we've been doing is the range and broad um, breadth of uh, domains that are going to be affected by the blockchain. And I'm wondering what Asia um, really is being affected by, like which domains, what parts of the industry of fintech are being affected by that? Okay. Yeah. We, we need to so yeah, <laughs> so there's a number of them. So payments clearly is one. Um, we spoke about lending, and so you know, and talking about some specific use cases here, even say lending to um, Chinese students who are here in the U.S. who, like you said, don't have the credit history, but also don't have the ability to, to have enough funds come from China because there's a limit to how many uh, uh, RMB can be exchanged, right, for USD. You, People have to get really creative. They have to figure out a way, and in some cases use cryptocurrencies, to channel the amount of funds that they need to get from um, China or Asia to the US because cryptocurrencies are much faster. Um, there isn't the same limit so to some degree. Um, and so, so people are getting creative that way. Now, um, in terms of the blockchain, so there's payments, there's um, the lending um, and a lot of the financial aspects, but core to all of this is identity management. And so I've been working with, um, we've been working with some Asian companies now on identity management as it supports healthcare. Um, and healthcare is also a big issue in China, right? Um, and, and the way the insurance um, is handled there, um, as it is in the US and probably many places in the world, but um, definitely in the US, as we've seen recently. So, but the, the issues are similar, right, around identity management. As a person, um, your identity is something of value. The data that you have about yourself is of is, is a value. And while the blockchain is really had first dealt with exchange of ownership being currencies or um, basically money, um, the idea of exchanging ownership of something, an asset of value, could also be data about yourself. And that's what um, some Chinese companies are now doing um, in tracking that data and that using that data, the important data, to understand how well medicines are working on particular groups of individuals or profiles of people. Um, and that, I think, is you know, profound impact, not just in China, but around the world. Right? If we could actually get that information um, together and, and have everyone you know, s provide data who touches a person, right? not just the doctor, but every specialist and every other person who interacts in some kind of healthcare activity right, with the person. If we could get all that data together, um, we could actually find out a lot more about the things that are working and aren't working um, and you know, reduce, reduce the cost, but also reduce disease. So uh, I find that very interesting, that, that kind of identity management type use case in the healthcare um, setting. But that's just you know, healthcare, right? Identity management um, can be also extended to supply chain. And, and when we say identity management, when I say identity management, I mean, really mean device management. So when you look at the supply chain and you look at your phone, for example, that battery could have been in many different places. It could have come from many different suppliers. And if your phone fails for some reason, how do you know which circumstances led to that failure? Was it that particular supplier, or was it the, the, the conditions that that battery went through as it came from the distributor to the supplier? So I just think identity management is very core and is one of those areas that um, is, is being explored and is very, uh, is, it has a potential for a, a lot of impact. No comment. Okay, so let me let me add two things, but um, let me cram it into a, available time. So actually, Hong Kong is has high hope in the blockchain application because it's not only cryptocurrency, but lots of things that can be done with a smart contract. Hong Kong actually has encouraged setting up of a new blockchain platform. It is spearheaded by Deloitte plus five of the leading banks in Hong Kong in the trade financing. 
because traditionally trade financing, the banks, and then all the title handling, letter of credit, very paper intensive, timing, and then lots of things, lots of people has to handle it. Blockchain has the capability of speeding up and validating identity, title transfer. So a smart contract will be an enabling technology to do that. It's happening in Hong Kong. Because Hong Kong handles 70% of the China export trade settlement. Just the banking system, 70% flow through Hong Kong. Very big. This is the first point. Second point is that ICO, Initial Coin Offering, Cryptocurrency. If you follow the news, actually Hong Kong made the headline in a way that early July, Hong, one of the Hong Kong company is called Block.1. They raised in five days 185 million ICO. World number one, world record. But then, interesting enough, the other company in San Francisco, Tesos, just 10 days later, made the 232 million ICO. So the ranking changed. So it's so exciting environment in the cryptocurrency, which is beyond just Bitcoin. So lots of things are happening. So what type of um, startups or companies do you think are attractive um, that have grown here to Asia? Uh, so I'll, I'll just say one thing, and probably Winston yeah. has some. Um, so definitely uh, the use cases around payments make sense, but uh, there are a lot of AI-type use cases that I've also seen um, companies interested in. Uh, so yeah, AI has been, been very prevalent. Yeah, there's payments and also um, a credit lending, whether it's P2P or B2B, that kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Let me add wealth management. Because let's say in Asia as a whole, two years ago people tell, told me that in Asia that high net worth people number already surpassed North America in terms of number. From Asia is bigger, a larger number than the, than the North America. Lots of wealth being accumulated. In Hong Kong, there are $2 trillion US dollar of wealth under management. So let me flow in some more details. So in the US, there are lots of the robo-advisor kind of portfolio management apps and solutions. So look, Hong Kong, China together is a very big market. Let me put it in perspective. NASDAQ is $8 trillion capitalization. New York Stock Exchange is about 20 trillion. So now, get the idea. Hong Kong is about 3 point something trillion. Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Shenzhen Stock Exchange is 3.5 also. Shanghai is about 4 point something. Adding together is 11. And then, Hong Kong is a very interesting arrangement with China, formal legal from the Beijing government, that there is Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect arrangement, Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect arrangement. Retail customer like me, I have a bank account, I have a stock trading account in the bank. I can do stock trading right now, market open in Hong Kong. Retail customer through Hong Kong, I can buy in Asia in Shanghai. I can buy in Shenzhen. Meaning that if a wealth management company here with a broker advisor or something, find the US market a little bit too crowded and too competitive, try Hong Kong. You get access to 11 trillion of market cap, and then you might be the earlier one to go into the market, and it's definitely less competitive with your technology right here. So lots of things happening again. So I know a lot of um, members in our um, talks and panels uh, talk about the regulation issues here in the US um, and that that can be a setback, um, a lot more work and a lot more focus. What's the situation like in Asia with regulation? Yeah, so I mean, in cryptocurrencies, Japan was the first to uh, pass you know, regulation around Bitcoin as a form of payment. So that's been pushing a lot of you know, Japanese companies to look at cryptocurrencies as well as the blockchain. China has also been very uh, much on the forefront. So their central bank um, has have been testing virtual coins. They've been working with a number of companies to understand how blockchains could work um, in a distributed way, in a centralized 
kind of government. So uh, the regulators are playing some interesting roles. And I, I was at a recent um, financial action task force meeting, um, which is a global community of financial regulators around the world. And very active there were uh, Singapore, as well as Japan and China. Um, and But all of them are trying to understand, right? And, and that was the, the great thing. I mean, and this is not just Asia, but all, you know, all the regulators like this. Um, but definitely the Asian ones were, were clearly trying to understand what's new, what's coming, um, how could it impact them, how could they get around it, and, and you know, what could they do to, to regulate, but also to help, you know, help grow industry in that direction. Yeah, I guess the Chinese government is supporting or embracing and supporting all the uh, emerging new technology companies, fintech companies. Um, they issue like quite a few, I believe around like a couple of hundred payment licenses um, in recent years to private companies, um, not necessarily banks. Um, I guess regulation is always a little bit behind. Um, it, it's comparing with the market development, but the government is, is the, uh, standing up and, and, and show their support. On the Hong Kong side, we are definitely one of the, the higher ranking uh, World Financial Center. So Hong Kong government always want to play a balance of how to embrace technology, but on the other hand, protect investors. So that's why even to the extent that we let go of Alibaba listing in Hong Kong, <laughs> because of their voting structure that they want, so it ended up in the US. So, but on the other hand, Hong Kong government is very serious. So we, within our central bank, we even have the chief financial technology officer and the facilitation office help our companies to talk to regulators. We also have the sandbox. So Hong Kong MA, the central bank, allow the operation of the sandbox, whereby it's quite active. And even with the fintech development, we have the S3, which is an R&D center working with companies to try out things. So Hong Kong government is definitely very much into the fintech um, technology, both embracing technology for the fin financial services plus the fintech development part of it. So I, I've been here seven years and I know generally in the startup ecosystem, many people want to know how they can move into the market in, in Asia and China. Um, but let's focus on the fintech area. How, how do startups or companies here in the US um, make a stand in, in China or Asia? Um, I guess you do your homework, do your research, understand the local market, understand your customer base, um, and get help if needed. Invest Hong Kong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I've seen a I've seen a couple of models emerge. Um, and you know, we being a startup, we're very interested in those models. Um, so for a while, there was the joint venture sort of model. Um, that doesn't seem to work as well in all cases. One, another model that, has, that I've seen actually gain more traction recently is the investment. So the, whether it's a venture firm or some Chinese company um, invests in a US firm. And then, you know, the last is, uh, yes, a U.S. firm could open up um, an office, which, you know, we've definitely talked to Lawrence about um, as an option, a very viable and attractive option. Um, and some companies have done that, so actually have a physical, you know, address. But in between all of those options, um, there is another option, which is partnering. And this is where I've seen, and, and we're doing this, where we're working with certain companies that already have a presence in China, um, and then we work out some kind of commercial arrangement um, where we share in um, the profits or the margin while the Chinese company has uh, the local address, which is you know, the, the big issue um, for tax and other legal reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. My answers tend to be long. I don't know why. So two parts of the answer. <laughs> so actually, there are practical assistance from my team in San Francisco right here called us up. In Hong Kong, we have lots of support, like funding. Companies will need funding. We have something very interesting called the matching grant, whereby the government will put in equal amount, 100% matching of your investment into your R&D project to commercialize something. So matching grant, non-dilutive, 100% shares and IP, you keep it. So Hong Kong will thank you doing it in Hong Kong. It's just one of the aspects. 
So all the help, there is a very vibrant fintech uh, community in Hong Kong. So come to us. The other part of the answer is that I talked to Maria. So with the base camp, let me bring up, bring up the, the base camp thing. I promise that, right? So China is a very big market, very big, very big market, but very challenging. Let me take the analogy of any expert, any people wanting to challenge the Mount Everest. So you better go for a base camp. You need a base camp, right? So start a base camp. So Hong Kong, take a look at Hong Kong. So base camp for China. For big, big companies, Fortune 500, everybody will have red carpet for you. But for smaller companies, you don't. You don't have the privilege. Come to Hong Kong, we are a base camp for you to know the market, learn the language, not the spoken language, but better. But it's the business language. And then the government and regulators' language, it can be quite obscure if you try to hear what uh, Greenspan says. So it's very difficult to interpret. So you need the base camp for survival. You need supplementary oxygen. You need the best guide in the world. Nowhere else, it must be at a base camp, down there at the foothill. And then you need the best guide, the knowledge, the weather, the season, but which route to take to the peak. You need a base camp to challenge the Mount Everest. Just like for China, if you are small, if you are limited in resources and in international Asia experience, first jump into China, it's very, very difficult. But try Hong Kong. Hong Kong is a very big financial market, big enough for you for the first one or two years. And then at the end of the first one or two years, you are much more capable. You know much more. You have much more contact. And then you know a better way, if not the best way to, China, to tackle China. So that's the what. The, the advice. So Maria, I fulfill my promise. Face <laughs> cam. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I I've lived in a few, quite a few countries in my life, and um, I think the thing that strikes me most about each country is that it has its own culture. And uh, so my next question is, um, how does the culture in Asia and China, how would that affect? Uh, a Western startup or a Western company. Um, I know when Facebook tried to um, first set up there, they had to shut down for a while and then opened up again. Um, obviously, there's big cultural challenges and there's probably also big opportunities. Um, would you like to talk more about that? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, I, I completely agree. Um, every country is different. Hong Kong is different than China. Uh, even though they're both Chinese. Uh, Taiwan is different than them, and uh, Japan is very different. So um, e every region is different. So I, I agree with what Winston was saying. You definitely have to do your research and understand if your particular market fits that particular country and culture. Uh, and there has to be the, you know, the stars aligning um, for it to work. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think it's important to have people who understand that culture. Um, so I'm Chinese, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this openly. I, I was born here, and um, I often get the sort of um, little slap on the hand saying, you know, you need to speak Chinese in meetings. And I'll say, oh, look at that. Mm, you know, I, I, can, I can order food in a restaurant really well, but I don't know if I really can give a technical presentation in Chinese. But yeah, you have to understand those things, and um, it's important. Yeah, so it is a critical element for any foreign company to go into China. I guess because of the communication, I'll give you one example. People say yes over there. Not necessarily means yes, like <laughs> in that context. Sometimes it's basically just acknowledging what you're saying. Um, so don't, don't, I guess don't make any mistake. If you cannot crack the code, understanding the culture, find the local people. I guess don't think is that everything, whatever works here, that wouldn't naturally work over there. Big mistake. So, so I'm gathering from that that it would be helpful to actually have an office um, with people on the ground in, in Asia mm -hmm. or China, correct? Yeah, definitely. Japan yeah. included, especially yeah. so. so. Yeah. Yeah. Because even companies as big as Apple, they have lots of challenges in China. But recently, just last week, it was announced that they are setting up a big, big data center in Guizhou. But in partnership with the China company, so that they can be fully compliant. So presumably, Apple will be 
uh, will be sourcing all the capital investment with the technology supply, but the operational aspect will be taken care of by the Chinese uh, partner. So that's one way. So the other way is that a small Hong Kong company started three years ago. So we Lab is the one that I mentioned. Series B, world largest, second largest, last year is called We Lab. So they can crack the code just as a startup three years ago. So they have market entry. So there are different ways of doing it. Now I'm going to bring up an ugly subject, but it's obviously got to be spoken about. I know that um, often startups here have a lot of fear about the cloning that happens in China. Um, I don't know about what happens in Hong Kong. Would you like to speak about that? What safeguards people can put in as regards that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'll start with that. So mm -hmm. absolutely, we're worried about that. Um, software especially, right? Um, it's so easy to, to clone software. Uh, and so, I mean, we put in safeguards like, uh, like what we do here. You know, the software stops working after a certain period of time because you have an agreement of how long that software is going to work. Um, yes, you have to be careful about back doors and, and other things that, um, the, you know, Chinese or other local companies could get through. Um, and in the end, you have to really know who you're working with, right? So regardless of the technical things that you put in place, it's a business partnership. And you have to have the, the setup, the model, um, so that it makes sense for you to continue to be in partnership together. <laughs> because regardless of whatever technical traps you put in, if you don't have that trust or that need for each other in that business model, everything's going to fall apart. <coughs> I guess just don't worry too much about your secrets or anything else. So I guess in China, if you run fast enough, nothing else matters. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I can uh, follow up on that because I have a high school classmate. He run a billion dollar revenue company in San Jose. He told me that he faced the same problem as, a, as an IT company, uh, hardware. He said that, yeah, there's a real problem. But as he said, he developed uh, products and technology faster than anybody else. So if, if he can release every six months new things, so let them catch up, but they have new things in the next six months. But let me, let me try to share with you one live example. I think I got permission to, to release it because I heard it from um, Motorola, an EVP of Motorola Asia some years ago. He was the former Science Park CEO in Hong Kong. The story goes like this. So Motorola, the, a leader in semiconductor, they had a plant, a fab in Tianjin, not far from Beijing. One day, the general manager of the Tianjin plant called him, called him up because he was based in Hong Kong, then Motorola EVP Asia. He said, boss, we have a problem. Somebody got our software. <laughs> so any design, anything come up, is basically a piece of file, and it's gone somewhere, somebody. It. So the EVP in Hong Kong says that calm down, young man, so not a big deal, no problem. So three or four months later, someone show up in his office, in the EVP Motorola office in Hong Kong, saying that, sir, can I buy a batch of that piece of the IC? So you know what he mean. And he said, ah, so it is you? who get the file. Because no one else in the world will need that IC if you don't have that file to run the software. To, right? So th the lesson the CEO told it in a conference that we organized, 200 people in Santa Clara, is that, that you have to take care of your IP on day one. You have to design either software hardware partitioning. Let's say you have your IC, but you, you sell it somebody, but you load the final piece of the software or the firmware somewhere else or later. So you have to think about it on day one. So the other latest example is that is the cancer diagnostic company. So he will be marketing in, in Asia. So the way he will be doing is that data capturing, wireless, Wi-Fi, cloud, and then the data, the analytic algorithm actually sits in Colorado. Anybody getting the data, raw data, not a big deal because the algorithm is sitting somewhere else. So there are different ways. You, you go faster than your competitor. 
partition your technology some way on day one or other approaches. There are different ways. Thank you. So um, we'd like to open up the floor for Q&A. Uh, so if anyone's got a question, OK, I'm going to bring the mics over. Um, so it's very interesting that you talked about, like, partitioning your, your technology, making sure you protect your IP. I think Hong Kong, for example, I lived there for a while, has some of the best technology in terms of fintech, the Octopus card. Now, on the flip side of that, is there ever a... I guess, an uh, initiative to open source some of the technology behind so that other players can come in and leverage that infrastructure. I mean, it's an incredible infrastructure. I, I rave about it to everybody yeah. so that other people can use it in their technology. Yeah, actually, so there is an indirect part of it. So Hong Kong is very open to, to embrace and encourage, encourage new technology development. Autopus card is quite ubiquitous. But on the other hand, the government issued 13 new licenses for store valued um, technology, uh, car technology. So that means the market, the regulator is quite open to any of the new players or any development, any adoption of new technology. We are very open. In most situations, Hong Kong government tried to adopt the so-called technology neutral uh, kind of policy so that we are not betting on one. Or the other. But it's so biased, and it's the MCR, and everybody has the market. Yeah, it, it's kind of they are the earlier or the forerunner in the space. Right. But now fintech is so new to everybody. It's new to us, new in the US. So I guess uh, there is no so called dominant player in many aspects. So I, I would say that in the future, yes, you, know, you will see more um, open technology. I was just reading an article today about how some of the truths that we used to hold self-evident or have been changing, right? It used to be you would buy IBM or somebody who was well known and you wouldn't go wrong. And now you can buy open source technologies or, or applications built upon open source technologies and you're just as fine. And that's becoming much more accepted. Um, so I'd say we're always going to be in that shift and, and, um, or in that moment where we're shifting from one paradigm to another. And I think this is one of them. Hello. Um, I just want to ask a question of the group, because we have such a nice group here today. How many people are actually in fintech companies now, or startup companies now? Oh, OK, a very large number. And how many of those are actually thinking of expanding um, in, let's say, the next year to Asia? Wow, so a fair number. So I'm kind of curious um, because I just, I'm a Hong Kong University professor who um, formerly was at Berkeley and at Wharton. And I just started a FinTech entrepreneurship class in Hong Kong where we have CEO mentors of Hong Kong startup companies. Um, and uh, some of the questions and interesting insights that I learned from that, I just wanted to test out in this group. How many of you, use AI or have AI as part of your business model? Five. How many blockchain? How many would say they were a mobile cloud or somehow use real, t real time? And what about data analytics? So, I mean, what I'm trying to point out is one of the things in Asia that would answer your question, might be a different answer to your question, is timing. I mean, when have we ever had this kind of convergence of, you know, ABCD, AI, blockchain, um, uh, cloud and data analytics at the same time when you have a vacuum in Asia in so many different areas from insurance to banking to unbanked to, um, you know, many different fields of payment. So part of it might be just that we are in a time period where any of these technologies applied uh, effectively, even using an existing business model, let's say Wealthfront or, or you know, anything that has worked Lending Club in the States, has an opportunity in China, which hasn't had any of those things you know, uh, uh, 
legacy systems to, to actually um, succeed. So maybe one, I'm just wondering, just looking at this crowd of people and having a little you know, sort of survey that, I mean, this is a really good indicator of those four areas, which I guess a number of unicorns in China call ABCD strategy, have an enormous potential if people now see the reason to go over and try and apply something that has been done or, or honed in the States, but in a greenfield kind of situation like Hong Kong and Southeast Asia and China. So just yeah. curious. Thanks, Amy. So I had a question about uh, the customers and the consumers over in Asia. Um, so are they more brand loyal to uh, local companies in that region if there were an identical one-to-one um, -one comparison in the technology? So I think that's part of the, the fear of going over there is that Maybe you're first to market in other uh, in other markets. Your technology is superior, but someone comes along and uh, just because it's labeled a local market from Japan, Korea, or China, that they would tend to have uh, more of a following and and support from government support and from consumer support. That so if you're a Western company, it's hard for you to to even play in that space. So maybe just understanding what the dynamics of the customer. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I guess if you're a Japanese company going to China, yes, absolutely it matters because of the history. Um, but if you're a Western, like say, European company or US company going to China, as long as you're, um, you know, I guess, keep the, the user experience in mind, I guess you will be fine. Can I go on? Um, do you, do you want to make any comments on that question? Yeah, so I, I would say so my experience has been you still have to have some local presence, some, somebody who's there who's shepherding the image of the company locally and has the trust of the people locally. So that's just my so view. Uh, uh, actually, apart from the look and feel, how localized it is, there are other parts of the business that if it is a technology, if it is a biometric, if it is a cybersecurity, so actually, it's not quite a brand, but it's you, you are embedded into another service offering. So in that respect, you, you don't need a brand, but you need market access. You need a good strategic partner. So in some ways, companies here are developing technology in those areas. So that could be, not, could not, would not be a major issue in some, in some ways. So I just want to comment that I think the opportunity is much bigger in B2B. Uh, I spent the last three years in Hong Kong. I'm still based in Hong Kong, uh, originally from Israel, bringing my B2B company into Asia. And currently, we have presence in Hong Kong and Shanghai. And what I've seen is that in B2C, it's extremely hard to compete with incumbents in Asia. From WeChat to Kakao to Line, all of these countries in Asia, it's a very fragmented sort of region, but you find that there are many very, very strong incumbents in those regions. Mm -hmm. B2B provides a good opportunity because there is a big vacuum in Asia still. The market has been uh, ripe for B2C disruption, like B2C technologies, and there is a massive adoption. But for very complex products in B2B, there is still a very big room for you to go into Asia. And we also enjoy the fact that we are a techno pure technology company. So our clients are regulated. They have to get local regulation in Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. But we can provide them the technology very fast. So the burden of complying and operating in these territories and the financing is on them. But we can give them the solutions very fast. The, the other part, let me offer something to you also. Now, for example, e-commerce. So it's very big business in China. But Alibaba is so big. If you are trying to knock on their doors from outside, it's kind of difficult. But for example, try Hong Kong, because Alibaba has a dedicated $120 million fund dedicated to Hong Kong startups. It's called Alibaba Entrepreneur Fund. Actually, this month, or just the past month, they are running a competition. So the winner, the top three winner, will each get one million US dollar funding from Alibaba Hong Kong Fund, and then they will be able to ride on the Alibaba platform for e-commerce. So that's one way that China is a very big market, very difficult, but through Hong Kong, there are very specific uh, help and avenue for you to 
to write on. Um, you've spoken a lot about China, Japan, Hong Kong. I was wondering if you could speak to the Southeast Asia fintech um, ecosystem and what the differences might be between Southeast Asia and the rest of Asia, or what the relationship is um, with Southeast Asia and the rest of Asia. We're not. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So. So we have some customers. Um, we have customers in India and the Philippines, Malaysia. Um, a lot of those customers that, that we have um, are grassroots. I mean, we're web services, so we haven't had to tailor what we do for those specific markets. So I don't know that we'd be the best um, to explain you know, the, you know, how you enter in uniquely, because the communities in those countries have found us. Um, and it's in that case, it's been word of mouth in, in their communities. Now we have gone back and we've done more organic type of marketing. Like we've gone to the meetups in the regions and talked to the people who are leaders. And blockchain is a unique kind of technology right now. It's new, it's small. You can still have that like grass, more grassroots type of um, impact and, and have it grow. We, we worked with um, three Hong Kong-based uh, uh, startups that were uh, Southeast Asia um, um, targeted, and they were all uh, uh, consumer plays, um, but ones that used uh, technology to uh, bring new services to each of these countries. Uh, we had um, Money Hero, which actually did uh, comparative loans uh, for many different countries, uh, and you know, kind of was like a mint-like product, but used uh, a sort of what was necessary in each of the each of the countries. Uh, we had Valute, which is actually a company that did um, currency exchange and allowed uh, companies in, you know, using WeChat in China and elsewhere to give rebates back to the consumer in each of the countries that, um, you know, each of the countries that, that uh, a buyer might be at. Um, and then we had Lendo, which actually did credit rating using social media for many Southeast Asian countries. So I think there are really a huge number of opportunities. These are all Hong Kong-based startups that um, were involved with Invest Hong Kong and received awards and incubation through the, um, through the uh, Hong Kong Cyberport as well as the Hong Kong uh, sort of uh, incubation system where there are many, many accelerators in including ones by large banks that will fund these kinds of efforts to be able to bring Hong Kong startups to Southeast Asia, kind of cross-border kind of activities. Thanks, Amy. Um, uh, we've got time for one more question. You've got it. <laughs> Uh, it's it's more on the user experience side and the product side. So basically, uh, we do facial recognition payments, and we are talking with uh, big companies from Hong Kong and Malaysia. Uh, what I see from WeChat and from uh, Alipay applications, they are really complex. The user experience, if you compare to, to here or to products in Europe or in America, they are much cleaner and uh, it's much easier to use. So is that because there's no option for the, for the Asians and, and not, I don't want to be at all aggressive or because we are, I'm from Brazil and we don't have many options as well? So that's a problem we have in Brazil, maybe could be. Or is that because the Asians like that kind of product and the way it is now? So that would say that the Asians are even more clever because they can use complex uh, tools. Like Because when I use WeChat, I cannot use it. There are 100 functions inside that it's, I get lost in the three clicks. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah, I guess people live and breathe uh, in WeChat in China. They can do so many things, I guess. Probably something physical they cannot provide, but other than that, um, they can, you know, all they need is a phone. They can travel around and do majority of the things that they need to do. Um, the door is always open. Um, if you can come up with something that's comparable or even better, um, yeah, why not? We're a web services company, so um, <laughs> we're in the back end. Like, I can't say too much about that.
we, we farm out to developers. I mean, application developers. Thanks, everyone. Um, we're going to actually now have an inter um, presentation from Michelle at Investate HK. And uh, so speakers can basically sit so down and Michael take it So Michael will talk about uh, FinTech Week in Hong Kong very briefly. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. I do realize. Right. I do realize I'm the person in between the presentation, uh, the, in between the discussion and the mingling session. Just give me five minutes. I will be super brief. So please keep it down. Uh, keep it down for a Polish guy who has good things to say about Hong Kong, but also about the uh, event coming up uh, in October. Shh. Five minutes. Five minutes. I, I, I'm going to be brief. I know that I'm in between the discussion and the mingling session, uh, but it's not over un until the Polish guy talks. Anyways, um, Lawrence mentioned the ba Basecamp, and there isn't a, a better place to talk about Basecamp than Startup Basecamp, uh, and he likes this metaphor a lot. But if you want to find a Basecamp within the Basecamp, there is one coming up uh, in October. It's Hong Kong FinTech Week, which is going to take place in Hong Kong, obviously, uh, in October between the 23rd and 27th. Um, and. Um, uh, Hong Kong FinTech Week is basically a week celebration of uh, everything that ecosystem in Hong Kong within FinTech uh, can offer you. Uh, if you want to connect dots, everything from VCs to stakeholders such as uh, regulators uh, to companies that can be your potential customers, Hong Kong FinTech Week is, is the place where you're going to find everything in one place. Um, in terms of, this is going to be our second edition. The first edition brought all the heavy hitters. Uh, from the regulators, which if you operate within FinTech, you know that you cannot really function without them. And they're not always super easily accessible, al although Hong Kong makes sure that they're as accessible as possible. But with, uh, during the FinTech week, they're actually there at the venue. Uh, but also the companies that you may be familiar with, and if you're not, I did some math, uh, they're valued at over uh, close to $30 billion. So you know, if you think about them as your potential customers, or your potential uh, competitors. Uh, they're going to be there. You can pick their brains up. You can try and pitch them. Uh, again, uh, there's no other place. They're going to be as accessible as during the Hong Kong FinTech Week. Uh, those are some other uh, customers, which, um, as you know, there are some people here that uh, are actually based uh, in uh, Hong Kong. I'm looking at you, Itai. I'm looking at you, Amy. And so they will tell you that they are the most important, uh, or some of the most important stakeholders in the Hong Kong fintech ecosystem. Uh, they're going to have their office hours, uh, and so ev everyone from the VCs uh, to the accelerators uh, to our cyberport co-working space, uh, everyone's going to be there. Uh, in China, as you know, in Hong Kong, we don't do things big. We do, we do them China big. So we're going to have 4,000 participants, uh, over 100 uh, speakers, 200 companies in attendance. Uh, again, we're going for big numbers. Uh, and so again, we are Invest Hong Kong. We are based in San Francisco. Uh, if you want us to help you with making connections and making meetings happen, we will be working uh, with you to make them happen. But if you want to accelerate it and sort of have it in all in all one place. As you see these numbers, it's going to happen in the week of October 23rd, 27th. Now, the way we split it up, uh, we of course split it up uh, between different verticals within uh, FinTech. Uh, and it's split up uh, Monday, Tuesday. It's going to be blockchain focused, uh, cybersecurity, uh, China FinTech, InsureTech, and WealthTech. Uh, Wednesday, uh, it's going to be focused on RegTech and meetings with regulators. Uh, and then Thursday, Friday, b big heavy focus on AI. Uh, and of course, the whole range of panel discussion, cocktail receptions, uh, and all kinds of ways of networking and pitching people. Uh, if I'm talking too fast, I'm sorry, but I, I promise I'm going to be quick, so uh, I'm delivering on that promise. Again, loads of stakeholders. And now, in terms of pricing, I told you this is the big place. Uh, the, the very important place, probably one of the most important places where you can meet all the stakeholders uh, that are important for entering Asia. So of course, uh, the participation cost is high. Uh, 
Well, actually, it's not. I'm oh, kidding. Uh, so the participation is only $100 for startups, $140 uh, for uh, startups after the early bird price. Um, I don't know if everyone can see it, but um, yeah, um, as I said, there is a block focus, um, so you don't have to uh, necessarily buy the ticket and attendance for the whole week. If you are in cybersecurity space, if you're in wealth tech, uh, you can just go Monday, Tuesday. That's where all this, uh, all the important uh, mm, parts of the ecosystem are going to be. And it's going to cost you around $100 plus hotel plus uh, tax fare. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, flight fare. But um, since we're talking about it uh, in uh, July, August, um, there's still time to actually make bookings and sort of uh, not be ripped off uh, by airlines. Um, Another nice surprise, apart from the price, is that uh, the uh, US delegation or America's delegation uh, is going to have some complimentary boots uh, and also um, some time for demos of your companies and products. And so if you are interested in attending, talk to me and I'll, I'll explain how we can make it happen for you. Um, and also another, I guess, nice surprise is that I'm going to be the head of that delegation. Uh, so uh, not only it's a nice surprise because I'm a nice guy, but also I guess it's a nice surprise because uh, my mandate is to make sure that you get the most ROI out of uh, going to Hong Kong for that week. Uh, so uh, if you're, again, if you're interested, either you have, an, uh, start, you have a startup or you're a professional that is interested in going to Hong Kong and um, setting this as your base camp for uh, working in FinTech space, uh, let me know ahead of time. We will work on meetings with you. Um, we will work on meetings with you, connecting the dots. Uh, we are government, so we do things free of charge. Um, so, you know, that's another great thing. Uh, and, and yeah, and apart from all of this, uh, we will also have some dedicated trips to Cyberport. Uh, we will uh, help you together with the Hong Kong Tourism Board to connect with the, uh, with, with the uh, tour operators who will show you a little bit of the Hong Kong uh, lifestyle. So there's a fun bit attached to it. So all in all, it's going to be an awesome week. Uh, don't wait. If you're interested in coming, uh, let me know. Uh, I'm going to be here uh, together with uh, all our panelists. So if you have any other questions about how it is to be in Asia, how it is to be in Hong Kong, take, take advantage of the fact that I'm here, that uh, our panelists are here, that Itai is here, Amy. Uh, we are here to talk to you and sort of make a case uh, for not being scared of Asia, and especially not being scared of Asia if you start uh, in the base camp, such as Hong Kong. That's it, and see you in Hong Kong. OK, actually, just final remark. I really would like to thank the host, Startup Base Camp. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. So thank you for having, thank you. And Pimo. Thank you. And Pimo. Pimo, thank you for the moderating. So thank you for having us.